Prelude is a short story by Catherine Mansfield. This short story is from a third-person anonymous omniscient narrator that depicts the everyday life of the Burnell household as they shift to the countryside. Like all Mansfield's works, this modernist fiction is open-ended and involves the stream-of-consciousness narrative technique. This is the third story about the Burnell family by Catherine Mansfield. Click on the links in the description box to learn about the previous stories involving the Burnells, At the Bay and the Doll's House. Today we will discuss in detail the summary, themes, and symbolism of the prelude and before we start, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. The prelude is cut into 12 sections. We will recap the toned-down versions of these 12 sections. The short story opens with a shortage of space on the removal buggy for Lottie and Kezia as the family prepares for a house move. Linda Burnell, their mother, playfully suggests leaving the sisters behind. Mrs. Samuel Josephs, a neighbor, offers to care for the girls until another card arrives in the evening. As the buggy departs, leaving the sisters with Mrs. Josephs, emotions surface. Kezia restrains her tears, but Lottie cries out to their mother and grandma on the departing buggy. The sisters join the Josephs for tea, barely concealing their tears. Later, Kezia explores their nearly empty old house, discovering a pillbox in her parents' room which she keeps. An unsettling feeling creeps over her, thinking something sinister, IT was just behind her. It turns out to be Lottie, and they depart with Fred, the store man, with Kezia sitting near Fred. Girls note the eerie change in surroundings at night while traveling since it was the first time that Lottie and Kezia had ever been out so late. Everything looked different. Kezia informs that their aunt and uncle live nearby their new home. Arriving at the new house, they are welcomed by their grandma, Mrs. Fairfield. Linda has got such a headache while having tea with Aunt Beryl, Linda's sister and Stanley's sister-in-law, and Isabel, the elder sister of Lottie and Kezia, was attending to their mother's hair. With Stanley Burnell, Linda's husband, present. During the conversation, Isabel mentions having a full chop for dinner, but is reprimanded for boasting. Stanley instructs his mother to provide food for Fred before he departs. Stanley objects to Beryl's rebuke of him for working during the house move, preventing him from assisting them. Meanwhile, Isabel notices Kezia using Aunt Beryl's cup for her tea. Mrs. Fairfield takes on the role of tucking the children into bed, with Lottie and Isabel in one room and Kezia sharing the grandmother's bed. Kezia lies awake in bed, hearing mysterious sounds from downstairs and envisioning a sky filled with countless black cats observing her. Lottie recites a bedtime prayer, and both she and Isabel drift off to sleep. In the meantime, Aunt Beryl, preparing for bed, daydreams about gaining financial independence from Stanley, and fantasizes about a wealthy Englishman entering her life. Stanley boasts to Linda about how he got the place dirt cheap, and they retire for the night. Pat and Alice, the servant girl, also settle into their respective rooms. Mrs. Fairfield, the last to retire, finds Kezia still awake. The following morning marks their first in the new home. Linda, dreaming of a hatched chick transforming into a baby, hints at her pregnancy. Stanley begins his day with exercises, proudly emphasizing his physical fitness, while Linda provides reassurance. Mrs. Fairfield reflects on past memories in her previous Tasmanian house while doing dishes. Aunt Beryl, angry and flushed, brings in unwanted paintings that she has hung at some place in the house. Linda, told by Mrs. Fairfield, tends to her children in the garden, where Kezia discovers a strange one huge plant with thick, gray-green, thorny leaves. And out of the middle there sprang up a tall stout stem. Some of the leaves of the plant were so old that they curled up in the air no longer, they turned back, they were split and broken. Some of them lay flat and withered on the ground. Linda informs Kezia that the plant is an aloe. Pat drives Stanley home from the office in a buggy. Stanley returns from work in a good mood, bringing home oysters, pineapple, and cherries. Reflecting on the joy of leaving the town behind, he indulges in cherries on the way home in the countryside. The family has dinner upon his return, and the children head to bed. Beryl, feeling lonely, plays the guitar alone and sings, Nature has gone to her rest, love, see, we are alone. Give me your hand to press, love, lightly within my own. Mrs. Smith and Mrs. Jones are initially introduced as grown-ups, until it becomes evident that the Burnell sisters are role-playing. The arrival of Pip and Rags, their cousins from the Trout family, accompanied by Dog, Snooker, disrupts the game. Together, the children deliberate on the next game to play. 
Pat, equipped with a little tomahawk that winked in the sun, proposes a shocking activity, chopping off a duck's head. The gruesome sight of a headless duck walking around prompts varied reactions from the children, with Cassia particularly distressed. Put head back. Put head back, she screamed. Surprisingly, she notices Pat wore little round gold earrings. She never knew that men wore earrings, challenging her preconceptions about men and jewelry. Meanwhile, in the kitchen, Alice prepares watercress sandwiches while reading Dream Book. Aunt Beryl enters, discovers the book, and asserts authority over Alice, instructing her to set out tea properly. Uncomfortable with Beryl's condescending tone, Alice dislikes feeling only a common servant girl. And what Alice really hated Miss Beryl for was that she made her feel low. She talked to Alice in a special voice as though she wasn't quite all there. The duck beheaded by Pat becomes the tea's main course, and Stanley and Beryl engage in a game of cribbage that Beryl loses. Linda and her mother venture into the garden to inspect the aloe, leading Linda to an epiphany about her feelings towards Stanley who was verbally and perhaps emotionally abusive to her at times. She realizes that for all her love and respect and admiration she hated him. A clueless Mrs. Fairfield thinks Linda was trembling from the cold. The narrative shifts to Aunt Beryl writing a letter to Nan Pym, her friend, expressing boredom with country life, dislike for neighbors and Stanley's friends. The short story ends with Kezia playing with her toy calico cat, using a moisturizing cream lid as an improvised mirror. The calico cat, seemingly overwhelmed by its reflection, loses balance and falls off the dressing table. Although the cream jar lid remains intact upon hitting the floor, Kezia, feeling embarrassed and ashamed, quietly leaves the room. Now let's talk about the important ideas and themes of the prelude. Linda, pregnant with a fourth child, occasionally contemplates abandoning her entire family without a farewell. She envisions her sentiments towards her husband as fluctuating between love and respect at one moment and transforming into hatred later. Linda's epiphany is a key moment, as she comes to detest her husband. There were times when he was frightening, really frightening. She could have done her feelings up in little packets and given them to Stanley. What am I guarding myself for so preciously? I shall go on having children and Stanley will go on making money and the children and the gardens will grow bigger and bigger, with whole fleets of aloes in them for me to choose from. Stanley, a businessman, desires a rural lifestyle, prompting their move from town to the countryside. He yearns for a son and envisions the traditional role of a woman engaged in household chores with no independent profession or freedom, contrasting with Aunt Beryl's aspirations. Described as disinterested and aloof, Linda remains detached from managing the household, leaving those responsibilities to her mother. She displays neglect towards her daughters, immersed in her own dreams and confined to her bedroom. Even when physically present with her family, like during a game of crib with her husband and sister, Linda appears emotionally distant, contemplating how remote they looked, those two, from where Linda sat and rocked. Prelude begins with two sisters, Kezia and Lottie, yet it is the older generation's siblings, Linda and Beryl, who take center stage as the true protagonists. Linda, a wife and mother, resides in a substantial house with her own family and garden. In contrast, Beryl, unmarried and childless, dwells with her sister's family, experiencing bitterness and loneliness. Both women are discontent as they struggle with dissatisfaction, emphasizing the gap between inner emotions and their verbal expression. Linda's revelation in section 11 and Beryl's conflicted sentiments through her letter to her friend in section 12 highlight this idea. Linda ponders that she could have done her feelings up in little packets and given them to Stanley. Beryl writes to Nan Pym that, in a way, of course, it was all perfectly true, but in another way it was all the greatest rubbish and she didn't believe a word of it. No, that wasn't true. She felt all those things, but she didn't really feel them like that. It was her other self who had written that letter. The last section of the prelude featuring Kezia, playing with her toy calico cat, reflects a maternal role, coercing the child to confront themselves, akin to chastising for misdeeds. In Mansfield's early 20th century New Zealand society, women seemingly face limited roles as repressed servants, wives, and mothers. Or spinster women assuming authoritative positions as entitled employers and imposing aunts while being financially dependent on relatives. Kezia, a highly imaginative child, perceives wallpaper parrot prints as real birds which persisted in flying past Kezia with her lamp and witnesses a chicken's beheading. 
Aunt Beryl, spinster and diffident, conceals her true self, dissatisfied with her life. The symbolic shattering of a cream jar lid, though not physically broken, signifies Cassia's loss of illusions and a glimpse into her future, even if not fully realized. Now let's discuss the two most important symbols of the prelude. Birds are recurring symbols within the shot story that represents pregnancy, motherhood, and confinements. The initial indication of her pregnancy occurs when she wakes up from a dream featuring a bird, using birds and babies interchangeably to subtly convey Linda's unspoken pregnancy. She made a cup of her hands and caught the tiny bird and stroked its head with her finger. It was quite tame. But a funny thing happened. It had become a baby with a big naked head and a gaping bird mouth. Opening and shutting. The symbolic image of a child with a bald head and a bird suggests that Linda might feel overwhelmed by the constant responsibility of having one child after another. Throughout Prelude, bird symbolism permeates the narrative, starting with Kezia finding a pillbox in their old home. Reminiscent of a tiny ball of fluff the cotton wool that transforms into a bird in Linda's dream. Kezia decided that I could keep a bird's egg in that in the pill box. Even upon reaching their new home, Lottie staggered on the lowest veranda step like a bird fallen out of the nest. Beryl's song serves as a facade, attempting to conceal her underlying unhappiness with verses like, How many thousand birds I see, that sing aloud from every tree. But the story also introduces a contrasting element with the beheading of a bird, challenging the notion that birds and by extension babies and children, exclusively bring delight and contentment to those encountering them. In Prelude, the choice of aloe is important, as its sharp thorns act as a deterrent, preventing people from approaching it. The rarity of the aloe's flowering, occurring once every hundred years, serves as a symbol of time and patience. The aloe plant serves as a representation of the intertwining of past and present, suggesting a continuity of experiences and emotions between different generations particularly reflected in the characters Kezia and Linda. The aloe is linked to Linda's apprehensions about sexuality, possibly representing a protective barrier against the potential harms or challenges associated with intimacy such as bearing children one after another. The thorns on the aloe plant symbolize the destructive nature of sexual relationships and the dominance of the patriarch. The aloe takes on a dual meaning, signifying both a source of power for Linda to distance herself from unwanted advances and a potential source of financial aspirations for Beryl, highlighting the contrasting desires and motivations of the two characters. The aloe's description as a fat swelling plant with its cruel leaves and fleshy stem gives it an enigmatic quality. The imagery suggests a plant that is both fascinating and potentially dangerous. The curving leaves seem to be hiding something. The blind stem cut into the air as if no wind could ever shake it create an aura of secrecy or unspoken desires and concealed grievances in the case of Beryl and Linda.